Hi friends and welcome to the Feather Cottage with Dee. Today we are going to be doing chapter 13, uh, me reading this to you. Today is Thursday and I am starting a new format. I'm going to be uploading on Thursdays the chapter that we'll be discussing on Wednesdays. So today I'm uploading 13, chapter 13, and we will discuss it May 8th at 1 central time. So I would love for y'all to join us. This gives everybody a few days to listen to it or read it if they have a copy. This is the book that we are doing the Bible study out of by Joyce Myers, The Battlefield of the Mind. And you can pick it up at any Christian bookstore, any bookstore, and even at Hobby Lobby uh, is where I got this copy. Um, so be sure to try to get yourself one if you can because it is an awesome book just to have always with you um, and remind you of how Satan attacks our minds. So I'm going to get into reading chapter 13 right now and then we will uh, discuss it on Wednesday, May 8th at 1 Central. Uh, much torment comes to people's lives because of judgmental attitudes, criticism, and suspicion. Multitudes of relationships are destroyed by these enemies. Once again, the mind is the battlefield. The scripture she has listed is, Judge not, that ye not be judged. Matthew 7, 1. Thoughts, just like, I think, could be the tool the devil uses to keep a person lonely. People do not enjoy being around anyone who needs to voice an opinion about everything. Sometimes we are more concerned about telling people what we think than we are about listening, learning, and building good relationships. To illustrate, I once knew a woman whose husband was a very wealthy businessman. He was generally very quiet, and she wanted him to talk more. He knew a great deal about a lot of things. She would get angry with him when they were in a group of people and someone started a conversation on a subject about which her husband could have knowledgeably contributed much insight. He could have told them everything he knew, but he wouldn't. One evening, after he and his wife had returned home from a party, she chastised him, saying, Why didn't you speak up and tell these people what you know about what they're talking about? You just sat there and acted as if you didn't know anything at all. I already knew what I knew, he replied. I tried to be quiet and listen so I could find out what others know. I would imagine that this was precisely way why he was wealthy. He was also wise. Few people gain wealth without wisdom, and few people have friends without using wisdom in relationships. Being judgmental, opinionated, and critical are three sure ways to see relationships dissolve. Satan, of course, wants you and me to be lonely and rejected. So he attacks our mind in these areas. This chapter, hopefully, will help you recognize wrong thought patterns as well as learn how to deal with suspicion. Judging defied. In Vine's Exploratory Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words, one of the Greek words translates as judgment is partially defined as a decision passed on the fault of others and is cross-referenced to the word condemnation. According to the same source, one of these Greek words translates, translated judge is particularly defined as to form an opinion and is cross-referenced to the word sentence. God is the only one who has the right to condemn or sentence. Therefore, when we pass judgment on another, we are, in a certain sense, setting ourselves up as God in his life. How about you? But that puts a little godly fear in me. I have a lot of nerve, but I am not interested in trying to be God. These are areas that once were a major problem in my personality, and I believe I would be able to share something God has taught me that will help you. Criticism opinions, and judgment all seem to be relatives, so we will discuss them together as one giant problem. I was critical because I always seemed to see what was wrong instead of what was right. Some personalities are more given to this fault than others. Some are more jovial personality types 
do not want to see anything but the fun or happy things in life. So they don't really pay much attention to the things that could spoil their enjoyment. The more melancholy personality or the controlling personality often sees what is wrong first. Generally, people with this type of personality are generous in sharing their negative opinions and outlooks of others. We must realize that we have our own ways of seeing things. We like to tell people what we think, and that is exactly the point. What I think may be right for me, but not necessarily right for you, and vice versa. Well, we all know, of course, that thou shalt not steal is right for everyone, but I am speaking here of the thousand of things we encounter every day that are neither right nor wrong necessarily, but are simply personal choices. I might add, these are choices that people have the right to make on their own without outside interference. My husband and I are extremely different in our approach to many things. How to decorate a house would be one of those things. It isn't that we don't like anything the other one chooses, but if we go out to shop for household things together, it seems Dave always likes one thing and I like something else. Why? Simply because we are two different people. His opinion is just as good as mine, and mine just as good as his. They're simply different. It took me many years to understand that there wasn't something wrong with Dave just because he didn't agree with me. And, of course, before I learned better, I usually let him know what I thought there was something wrong with him because he did not share my opinion. Obviously, my attitude caused much frustration between us and hurt our relationship. Pride, an I problem. I warn everyone among you not to estimate and, th and think of himself more highly than he ought to, nor not to have extravagant opinion of his own importance, but to rate his ability with sober judgment, each according to the degree of faith appointed by God to him. Romans 12, 3. Judgment and criticism are fruit of a deep of a deeper problem, pride. When the I in us is bigger than it should be, it will always cause the kinds of problems we are discussing. The Bible repeatedly warns us about having high, about being high-minded. When we excel in an area, it is only because God has given us a gift of grace for it. If we are high-minded or have an extravagant opinion of ourselves, then it causes us to look down on others and value them as less than we are. This type of attitude or thinking is extremely detestable to the Lord, and it opens many doors for the enemy in our lives. Holy fear. Brethren, if any person is overtaken in misconduct or sin of any sort, you are to spiritually, who are responsible to and controlled by the Spirit, should set him right and restore and reinstate him without a sense of superiority and with all gentleness, keeping an attentive eye on yourself, lest you should not be tempted also. Bear, endure, and carry one another's burdens and troublesome moral faults. In this way, fulfill and observe perfectly the law of Christ, the Messiah, and complete what is lacking in your obedience to it. For if any person thinks himself to be somebody too important to consider to shoulder another's load, when he is nobody of superiority except in his own esteem, he, is de he deceives and dilutes and cheats himself. Galatians 6, 1 through 3. Careful examination of these spirits quickly reveals to us how we are to respond to the weakness we observe in others. It sets forth the mental attitude we are to maintain within ourselves. We must have a holy fear of pride and be careful of judging others or being critical of them. Who are we to pass judgment? Who are you to pass judgment on and censor another's household servant? 
It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he shall stand and be upheld, for the master, the Lord, is mighty to support him and make him stand. Romans 14, 4. Think of it this way. Let's say your neighbor came to your door and began instructing you on what your children should wear to school and what subjects she felt they should take. How would you respond? Or suppose your neighbor stopped to tell you that she didn't like the way you cleaned your home. What would you say to your neighbor? Surely you would tell her to mind her own business. This is exactly the point of scripture is making. Each of us belongs to God. And even if we have weaknesses, he's able to make a stand and justify us. We answer to God, not to each other. Therefore, we are not to judge one another in a critical way. The devil stays very busy assigning demons to place judgment, critical thoughts in people's minds. I can remember when it was entertaining for me to sit in the park or the shopping mall or simply watch all people go by as if I formed a mental opinion of each of them, their clothing, their hairstyle, companions, etc. Now, we can't always prevent ourselves from having opinions, but we do not have to, ha to express them. I believe we can even grow it to the point where we do not have so many opinions, and those we do have are not of a critical nature. I frequently tell myself, Joyce, it's none of your business. A major problem is brewing in my mind when you ponder your opinion until it becomes a judgment. The problem grows bigger the more you think about it until you begin to express it to others or even to one you're judging. It has become more explosive and has the ability to do, to do a great deal of harm in the realm of the relationship as well as the spiritual realm. You may be able to save yourself future problems by simply learning to say, this is none of my business. Judgment and criticism were rampant in my family, so I grew up with them, so to speak. When, it, when that is the case, as it may be for you, it is like trying to play ball with a broken leg. I was trying to play ball with God. I wanted to do things his way, to think and act his way, but I couldn't. It took many years of misery before I learned about the strongholds in my mind that had to be dealt with before my behavior could change. Remember, your actions won't change until your mind does. Matthew 7, 1 through 6 are some of the classic scriptures on the subject of judgment and criticism. When you are having trouble with your mind in this area, read these and other scriptures. Read them, then read them over aloud and use them as weapons against the devil who is attempting to build a stronghold in your mind. He may be operating out of a stronghold that he has already been there for many years. Let's take a look at this passage, and I will com comment on each part as we go through it. Sowing and Reaping Judgment Do not judge and criticize or condemn others so that you may not be judged and criticized and condemn yourself. For just as you judge and criticize and condemn others, you will be judged, criticized, and condemned in accordance with the measure you use to deal out to others. It will be dealt out against you. Matthew 7, 1 and 2. These scriptures plainly tell us that we will reap what we sow. See Galatians 6, 7. Sowing and reaping does not apply only to agricultural and financial realms. It applies to mental realms. We can sow and reap an attitude as well as a crop or an investment. One pastor I know often says that when he hears that someone has been talking about him in an unkind or judgmental way, he asks himself, are they sowing or am I reaping? Many times we are reaping in our lives what we have previously sown into the life of another. Physical heal, physicians heal thyself. Why do you stare from without at the very small particle that is in your brother's eye, but not become aware of and consider the beam or timber that is in your own eye? Nor can you say to your brother, let me get the tiny particle out of your eye when there is a beam of lumber, when there is a beam of timber in your own eye. You hypocrite. 
First get the beam of timber out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the tiny particle out of your brother's eye. Matthew 7, 3 through 5. The devil loves to keep us busy mentally judging the faults of others. That way we never see or deal with what is wrong with us. We cannot change others, only God can. We cannot change ourselves either, but we can operate in the Holy Spirit and allow him to do the work. Step one to any freedom, however, is to face the truth the Lord is trying to show us. When we have our thoughts and our conversations on what is wrong with everyone else, we are usually being deceived about our own conduct. Therefore, Jesus commanded that we do not concern ourselves with what is wrong with others when we have so much wrong with ourselves. Allow God to deal with you first, and then you will learn the spiritual way of helping your brother grow in his Christian walk. Love one another. Do not give which is holy, the sacred thing, to the dogs. Do not throw your pearls before hogs. Least they trample upon them with their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Matthew 7, 6. I believe this scripture is referring to our God-given ability to love each other. If you and I have ability and are commanded by God to love one another, but instead of doing that, we are judging and criticizing them, we have taken the holy thing, love, and cast it before dogs and hogs, demon spirits. We have opened a door for them to trample on holy things and turn and tear us into pieces. When we need to see that, the love walk is protected for us against an evil attack. I do not believe the devil can do much harm to someone who really walks in love. When I became pregnant with our fourth child, I was a Christian, filled with the Holy Spirit, called into ministry, and diligent Bible study. Bible student. I had learned about exercising my faith for healing, yet during the first three months of the pregnancy, I was very, very sick. I lost weight and energy. I spent most of my time lying on the couch, nauseated, so I tried so tired I could barely move. This situation really confused me since I had felt wonderful during my other three pregnancies. I didn't know much of God's word then, even though I was in church and did not actively use my faith for anything. Now, I was very familiar with God's promises, yet I was sick. And no amount of prayer to God or resisting the devil was removing the problem. One day, as I was lying in bed listening to my husband and children having a good time in the backyard, I aggressively asked God, What in the world is wrong with me? Why am I so sick? And why am I not getting well? The Holy Spirit prompted me to read Matthew 7. I asked the Lord what the passage had to do with me and my health. I kept feeling that I should read it again and again. Finally, God opened my remembrance to an event that had taken place a couple of years earlier. I had led and taught a home Bible study to which a young lady came we called Jane. Jane attended the course faithfully until she became pregnant, but then it became very difficult for her to join us regularly because she was always tired and feeling bad. As I laid in my bed that day, I recall the other Christian sisters, and I had talked about, judged, and criticized Jane because she just would not press through her circumstances and be diligent to come to Bible study. We never offered to help her in any way. We just formed an opinion that she was weakling and was using her pregnancy as an excuse to be lazy and self-indulgent. Now, I was in the same circumstance that Jane had been two years earlier. God showed me that although I had been healthy during my first three pregnancies, I had opened a huge door for the devil by my judgment and criticism. I had taken my pearls and holy things, my ability to love Jane, thrown it before the dogs and hogs, and now they had turned and were tearing me to pieces. I could tell you I was quick, I was quick to repent. As soon as I did, my health was restored, and I was fine through the remainder of my pregnancy. From this incident, I learned an important lesson about dangers of judging and criticizing others. I would like to be able to say that after that experience, I never made another mistake of that nature. But I am sorry to say that I have made many mistakes since then. Each time, God has dealt with me, for which I am grateful. 
We all make mistakes. We all have weaknesses. The Bible says that we are not to have a hard, a hard heart, critical spirit toward each other, but instead to forgive one another and to show mercy to one another, just as God, for Christ's sake, has done for us. See Ephesians 4.32. Judging brings condemnation. Therefore, you have no excuse or defense or justification. O oh man, whoever you are who judges and condemns another. For in posing as judge and passing sentence on another, you condemn yourself, because you who judge are habitually practicing the very same thing that you censor and denounce. Romans 2.11 In other words, the very same thing that we judge others for, we do ourselves. The Lord gave me a good example once to help me understand this principle. I was pondering why we would do something ourselves and think it perfectly all right, but judge someone else who does it. He said, Joyce, you look at yourself through rose-colored glasses, but you look at everyone else through a magnifying glass. We make excuses for our own behavior, but when someone else does the same thing we do, we are often merciless. Doing unto others as we want them to do to us, Matthew 7, 12, is good life principle that will prevent a lot of judgment and criticism if followed. A judgmental mind is an offshoot of a negative mind, thinking about what is wrong with an individual instead of, of what is right. Be positive and not negative. Others will benefit, but you will benefit more than anyone. Guard your heart. Keep and guard your heart with all diligence, and above all, you guard, for out of it flows the spring of life. Proverbs 4.23 If you want to have life flowing to you and from you, guard your heart. Certain types of thoughts are unthinkable for a, behavior, for a believer. Judgment and criticism are among them. All the things that God tries to teach us are for our own good and happiness. Following his ways brings fruitfulness. Following the devil's ways brings rottenness. Be suspicious of suspicion. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. It is ever ready to believe the best in every person. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. I can honestly say that obedience to this scripture has always been a challenge for me. I was brought up to be suspicious. I was actually taught to distrust everybody, especially if they pretended to be nice, because they must be wanting something. In addition to being taught to be suspicious of others and their motives, I had several ways of disappointing I had I had several very disappointing experiences with people, not only before I became an active Christian, but afterward as well. Meditating on the components of love and realizing that love always believes the best can help me greatly to develop a new mindset. When your mind has been poisoned or when Satan has gained strongholds in your mind, it has to be renewed according to God's word. This is done by learning the word and meditating, pondering, muttering to yourself, thinking on it. We have the wonderful Holy Spirit in us to remind us when our thoughts are going in the wrong direction. God does this for me when I, have, when I am having suspicious thoughts instead of loving thoughts. The natural man thinks, if I trust people, I'll be taken advantage of. Perhaps, but the benefit will far outweigh any negative experience. Trust and faithfully enjoy, trust Trust and faithfully bring joy to life and help relationships grow to their maximum potential. Suspicion cripples an entire relationship and usually, usually destroys it. Bottom line is this. God's ways work. Man's ways don't. God condemns judgment, criticism, and suspicion. And so should we. Love what God loves. Hate what he hates. Allow what he allows and disallow what he disallows. A balanced attitude is always the best policy. That doesn't mean that we are not to use wisdom and discernment in our dealings with others. We don't have to throw open our life to everyone we meet, giving every person we encounter a chance to crush us. On the other hand, 
we don't have to look at everyone with a negative, suspicious eye. Always expecting to be taken advantage of by others. Trust God completely and man discreetly. But when he was in Jerusalem during the Passover feast, many believed in his name, identified themselves as his party. After seeing his signs, wonders, and miracles, which he was doing. But Jesus, for his part, did not trust himself to them because he knew all men and he did not need anyone to bear witness concerning man. Needed no evidence from anyone about man, men for himself knew what was in human nature. He could read men's hearts, John 2, 23 through 25. One time after I had been involved in a disappointment, disappointing church situation, God brought John 2, 23 to 25 to my attention. This passage, to speak, this passage is speaking of Jesus' relationship with his disciples. It plainly says that he did not trust himself to them. It does not say that he was suspicious of them or that he had no trust in them. It just explains that because he understood human nature, which we all have, he did not trust himself to them in an unbalanced way. I've learned a good lesson, and I've been hurt badly in a situation at church because I had become too involved with a group of ladies and had gone out of balance. Every time we got out of balance, we opened a door for the devil. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be well balanced, tempered, sober of mind. Be vigilant and cautious at all times. For the enemy of yours, the devil, roams around like a lion, roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. I have learned that I have been leaning on the ladies in this group and placing them in trust that belongs only to God. We can only go, we can go only so far in human relationships. If we go beyond wisdom, trouble will brew and we will be hurt. Always place your ultimate trust in the Lord. Doing so will open the door for the Holy Spirit to let you know when you're crossing over the line of balance. Some people think they have discernment when they, actually they are just suspicious. There is a true gift the Spirit called in discerning the spirits. 1 Corinthians 12.10 It is discerned good and bad. Just It discerns good and bad, not just bad. Suspicion comes out of unrenewed mind. Discerning comes out of renewed spirit. Pray for the true gift, not flesh, that masquerades as a gift of spirit. True spiritual discernment will prove, provoke prayer. Pray for true gifts, not flesh, that masquerades as gifts of the spirit. True spiritual discernment will prove, provoke prayer. True spiritual discernment will provoke prayer, not gossip. If a genuine problem is being discerned by a genuine gift, it will follow the scripture pattern for dealing with it, not fleshly ways that only spread and compound the problem. Pleasant words are sweet and healing. The mind of the wise instructs his mouth and adds learning and persuasiveness to his lips. Pleasant words are like honeycomb, sweet to the mind and healing to the body. Proverbs 16, 23, 24. Words and thoughts are like bone and marrow, so close it is hard to divide them. Hebrews 4, 12. Our thoughts are silent words that only we and the Lord hear, but these words affect our inner man, our health, our joy, our attitude. These things we think of often come out of our mouth, and sad to say, sometimes they make us look foolish, judgmental, criticism, and suspicious, Never bring joy. Jesus said that he came in order that we might have and enjoy life. See John 10.10. 10. Bring into operation. Beginning to operate in the mind of Christ, you will step into a whole new realm of living. This concludes chapter 13 of Battlefield of the Mind by Joyce Meyer. We will be in discussion of this on Wednesday, May 8th at 1 Central. If you can join us, we'd love to have you. For those that have stayed to the end, thank you very much. I would love for you to give this a thumbs up, and I pray that you all have a wonderful and blessed week. See you Wednesday. Bye-bye.